Thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, before we begin, um, this discussion will also be aired as a podcast on Food Talk with Danny Nuremberg. That's my last shameless plug of the day, I promise. Um, so there are a bunch of, of amazing women who have influenced me throughout my career and that, who I'm grateful for and who have mentored me or criticized me or offered suggestions in different ways. And, and one of them is obviously Marian Nessel. Um, she's one of those people, like uh, our other uh, keynote speakers and, and fireside chat speakers, she's impossible to introduce. Um, but I, I saw her last week at another conference and she said that she just met a student who actually cried when she met Marion because uh, uh, Marion had influenced her life so much. And, and Marion was telling me this story and she's like, can you believe that? Why would someone cry when they would meet me? And I told her, I was like, I wanna cry every time I meet you because I'm so in awe of you. So I, I'm really thankful uh, uh, for Marion's presence here today. Um, she has helped me and so many people understand that food is political and we can all make better choices, not only about what we eat, but who we vote for. <laughs> Absolutely. She has been a consumer advocate, nutritionist, author of a number of prize winning books, and an academic who specializes, again, in the politics of food and dietary choice. Her degrees include a PhD in molecular biology and a master's of public health, uh, both from the University of California, Berkeley. Um, I was at an event celebrating her retirement uh, earlier this year, but she is not slowing down by any means. Her forthcoming book, uh, Unsavory, The Unsavory Truth, How Food Companies Skew the Science of What We Eat, will be released later this fall or is already out? No, October 30th. October 30th, yay. And, and since we're doing shameless self-promotion, I've got cards. Yay. There's some cards in the back. Please buy her book. It's going to be fabulous. Um, so I, I wanted Marianne to be here today, not necessarily because she's an expert uh, on food waste, but she is an expert on policy and nutrition. And I really wanted um, her to share her thoughts about this issue. So Marianne, I'm gonna throw a quote at you that you've said before, and then we can go from there. You've said that working on food waste is easier than alleviating hunger. So do you think this issue of food waste gets too much attention? I think it's an entry point into food politics, and I'm so excited that all of you are here. Um, I, I want to state my food waste credentials right off the bat. I have a terrace in Manhattan a couple blocks from here, and I compost on my terrace. Um, and I think food waste is an enormously important issue because it's something that every single one of us can do on our own. But I'm a public health person, and when we, public health people look at root causes of social problems and the root cause of food, wa food waste isn't what you do in your kitchen, it isn't even what grocery stores do or what restaurants do. The root cause is overproduction in our food system. We need a new food system. If we're, if we're going to do something about food waste, we have to change the food system. Our food system is designed to be wasteful. And the figure that I love to give is that we have 4,000 calories available in our food supply per day. Every single person in the country, 4,000 calories. That's enormous men, little teeny women, itsy bitsy babies, 4,000 calories. On average, we need about 2,000. That means 2,000 calories a day are wasted. They disappear someplace, or it, we set up a system in which the food system is trying to get you to eat far more than you need, to buy more than you need, and therefore to waste more than you need. That's how the system works. So we're wasting it in our bodies as well by overeating. Absolutely. That, that's, I think that's the root cause of obesity. The food industry has to sell those calories. Their job is to sell calories. Absolutely. So can we unpack this overproduction? Why are we overproducing? What has led to this overproduction of, of calories? Yeah, the total pressure to produce cheap food. 
And let me say that the food that we buy at the supermarket is cheap for a lot of us. It's not cheap for everybody, but it's cheap for a lot of us. But that's because we're not paying the, what are called the externalized costs of food production at the supermarket. We pay for them in environmental cleanup. We pay for them in obesity. We pay for them because taxpayers support food industry marketing. Every one of the $30 billion a year that the food industry spends to sell us food is tax deductible. We pay for that. Um, so the externalized costs of food are the horrible conditions for food labor, the uh, obesity and ill health in the population, um, and that's part of what's involved in a food system that's designed to produce food cheaply as much possible. You know, our, our yeah. federal agricultural policies are set up to get food producers to produce as much food as they possibly can. Right. That's well, the deal. Well, I'm, I'm interested. You brought up this, and I'm glad you did, this issue of true cost accounting is basically what you're saying and how we should be accounting for those external costs, whether it's obesity or heart disease. Or waste. Or, or waste. Or waste, which is the issue that we're here talking about. So today. how do we encourage policymakers to start doing that? How can we build that back into the food system? Well, I think there are two ways. First of all, you vote with your fork. And every single time you make a decision about what you spend your money on, you're voting for the kind of food system that you want. If you're buying from local farmers, you're supporting local farmers. Um, that's one way to do it. And then the other is, you got to vote with your vote. Run for office, please. Absolutely. I mean, I I've been so pleased here because there are so many young people in the audience mm -hmm. who can start taking on those challenges and start being political. Do you have any advice for, I mean, you've been a teacher most of your career. What, what advice do you give the young people here, especially young women, about how to get more involved? Learn as much as you can about the issues you care about and run for office. Talk to, or if you, if you can't bear the thought, um, then at least get involved in local politics. Go to your schools and make sure that the schools are, are serving healthy, hopefully local food to kids as to the gardens in schools. Anything that you can do, the sooner kids start learning about where food comes from and how to deal with it, the healthier their relationship with food will be throughout their lives. Talk to your city council about making a better food systems in the area, local food systems. Start local. The, you know, the federal stuff is too hard to deal with, um, you know, really difficult to deal with, and the politics are terrible, but local politics are still okay in lots of places, and that's a place to come in. And if enough people go into politics and are sitting on school boards, city councils, and other kinds of local places, things will happen. You can fix things in your community. Well, I think it's interesting that more people are running for school boards. I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such an effective way to make change and really do what you were describing, make things happen for children very early in their lives that right. are more beneficial. And if you go to a school that has a decent food program, I don't know, talk about crying. It brings tears to my <laughs> eyes every time I see them because the kids are eating real food and liking it and enjoying and know something about it. It's astonishing to see. Absolutely, absolutely. So I want to get back to, to waste for just mm -hmm. a minute. You've talked about and written about the pet food industry. Yes. Do you think this is an effective way to use byproducts <laughs> and, and overproduction to to put into the, the sort of the yeah, pet food uh, uh, industry? Pet food, if you don't understand it, is a way to deal with the waste products of human food production. And my writing partner and I, uh, in our book, Feed Your Pet Right, did a calculation of the amount of food that was produced, that it goes into pet food, and the number of calories of wasted food that goes into pet food, and we calculated that enough food goes into pet food that would um, otherwise be feeding 32 million people. In other words, if we weren't using those products for pet food and pet owners were using human food, it would be the equivalent of food for 32 million people because there's 150, 150 million pets in this country. Um, there's one climate change book that says that the single most important thing you could do to alleviate ch climate change would be to not have pets. I'm not advising that. <laughs> 
<laughs> Me neither. <laughs> um, I love my cat. Um, I, 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 I want to talk to you about the unsavory truth. Um, Why was it important to write this book now? Well, it uh, turns, it turns out to be a very timely book. It's a book about how the food industry influences nutrition research and practice. And this is an issue that's getting more and more attention in the press. It's an issue I've written about for a long time, but never in a focused way. This book writes about it in a focused way. Um, I think that we're very confused about uh, diet and health. I hear questions from people all the time about, I'm just so confused, you nutritionists change your advice all the time, and one day there's a research study that says this, and the next day it says something else, and what are we supposed to believe? And my answer to that, by the way, is it's so simple that Michael Pollan can do it in seven <laughs> right. words. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Really, that's all there is to it. Um, but... <laughs> Yeah, let's hear, let's hear it from Michael Pollan, <laughs> who just writes so well. I know, right? Um, the, uh, the, uh, but it, if you're confused, I think it's, the food industry has a lot to do with that. You know, and I've written in my book, Soda Politics, I wrote about how Coca-Cola funded research to show that soft drinks were really good for you. Um, and it turns out Coca-Cola is not the only company that does that. Mars tries to convince you that chocolate is a health food. Almost every food company wants to convince you that their food is a superfood. I get letters all the time from uh, trade associations saying, we're looking for research proposals to demonstrate the benefits of our product. Not we're looking for research to find out what the effect of our product is on health. We're looking for research to demonstrate benefits. And that's, and I, I thought, this is confusing everybody. It influences dietary guidelines. Mm -hmm. It influences uh, public opinion about foods. It confuses things. It induces distrust in nutrition research. It breaks my heart. Absolutely. W wouldn't you say, or wouldn't the, the food industry say that they're just responding to demand? That this is what consumers want. That consumers want research about. No, that they no, but that they want these foods that are not beneficial to them. They want. Food. I think people want to eat healthfully and would like clarity. Mm. At least that's what I hear. Is they want clarity and to say, you know, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, you may understand what that means, but a lot of people really don't. Um, and what do you mean by plants? But from the standpoint of the food industry, the point is to sell more food. These are not social service agencies. They're not evil people either, but they're not social service agencies. They're businesses that are trying to sell as much of their product as they possibly can. I think the question to ask is what's wrong with marketing pomegranates, blueberries, pecans, walnuts, macadamia nuts, fruit juice, anything that you can think of. What's wrong with marketing those things is healthy. Um, well, I think it's misleading. Mm. They are healthy, but so is every other fruit and vegetable and nut. Right. And the, the, the real secret of healthy diets is a wide variety of unprocessed foods. Um, I mean, that's also sort of simple rule, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it works. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, turning back to more whole foods is really good advice. But, you know, we were talking earlier about underserved communities and, and people who have three jobs and might not have a working stove in their apartment or wherever they live. What, what do we tell folks who are sort of struggling every day, you know, and, and they don't have access to or can afford we those kinds of things? We tell them that our political system needs to be changed so that they're not in that situation. This, that situation is not their fault. Absolutely. Um, in, many, in most cases, if not, you know, I, I mean, I can't say all, but in many cases, it's not their fault. They um, had bad luck in choice of parents, in choice of neighborhood, in choice of a lot of other things, and we need a political system that supports them much better. Right. Poor people have a right to healthy food, too. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, you know, you brought up the dietary guidelines earlier, yes. and so that's coming up again, and you can explain that. But in the last set of dietary guidelines, if I'm correct, there was sort of a push 
to include more environmental sustainability mm -hmm. in, in the guidelines. And that sort of happened, kind of, but didn't end up really making it into the final set, right? What do you think will happen in the next set of dietary guidelines? I can't wait to see. <laughs> the, uh, the, the call has been out for nominations. I think it's out right now for nominations to the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. The process is totally politicized this year. It's being run by the Department of Agriculture. And the last set of guidelines, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, um, was very concerned about meat, both as, particularly beef, uh, both as a source of poor health, uh, but also as a source of greenhouse gases. Um, the one thing that we could do would, that would reduce the greenhouse gases that are produced by our agricultural system is to produce less meat. Mm -hmm. um, and the meat industry was pretty upset about that. They lobbied and the Department of Agriculture said, okay, we will not mention the word sustainability in the dietary guidelines. And you can go online and you will not see the word sustainability anywhere in the 2015 dietary guidelines. Um, the political situation hasn't changed since 2015. It's gotten worse. Absolutely. So I'm not optimistic about this one, and I feel really sorry for any nutrition scientist who goes on that committee because they will be under a level of scrutiny that they didn't even believe possible. Well, I mean, I think so much of what you do is myth-busting and, and seeking out the truth. How do you, as, as an educator, a communicator, an academic, how are you dealing with you know, the tough political situation we're in right now? How do you make headway? Well, I feel the same kind of existential angst that everybody else does. Um, but I deal with young people, and I think that you know, I see the students in my program and the people that come to the talks that I give who are just so excited to be working on food issues, know what kind of food issues they should be working on, really care about it, and I can't help but be inspired by that. Me too. I get to work with a lot of young people, and it is. That's what keeps me going. Keeps you going, absolutely. You know, I've been saying all day, I wish Haley Thomas could just sit on my shoulder and remind <laughs> me why I do this. Um, I, I, I think, you know, that We've talked about the dietary guidelines, and you're going to laugh at me. What, what do you think about the upcoming farm bill? <laughs> <laughs> um, I once wrote an article about the farm bill that I think was titled, The Farm Bill Drove Me Crazy. <laughs> um, I write about the farm bill on my blog. I think I did today, actually. Um, and it's Can you tell people where to find your blog? Uh, foodpolitics.com. Um, I post almost every day, at, on, not on weekends, but during the week. And I think I had one on the Farm Bill today, sort of a wrap-up of what kinds of, what the big issues are in the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill literally deals with hundreds of programs. And each one of those programs has its own set of dedicated lobbyists. The only people who really understand those programs are the lobbyists who deal with it. Because for anybody, for any normal person, it's really impossible to get the whole thing. So you pick your issue um, and you try to understand that issue and deal with your congressional representatives about it. But for most normal people, it's just an impossible task, particularly b because SNAP is in it. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, food stamps, is in the farm bill of all places. And the current political regime has only one interest in SNAP, and that's to cut it. They don't care about it, anything else about it. They just want to cut it. Um, and that's heartbreaking to watch, sure. difficult to watch, and you just hope that your elected representatives in the Senate, because the House is hopeless, but in the, you hope that your senators will at least put a stop to the worst of it. The issue isn't um, whether it's going to be cut. The issue is by how much. Absolutely, and that's why November is so important this year. Terrible. Please vote. Absolutely. Run for office. <laughs> Great advice. I, I do want to go to Q&A and make sure that um, you all get to ask Mary, Marian some questions. Can we bring up the lights and get some microphones? It'd be nice to see you. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, lots of hands. Let's go in the front first. Hi, my name is Jadina. I'm with Just Food. Um, I'd like to echo some of the questions and points that a few people have brought up throughout the day about how we live in a system where food is not considered a human right. Um, so if we have this overproduction um, and there actually is no scarcity, there's still no guarantee that every person will be fed and there's actually many people who are denied food. My question is, how can we move towards a system where food is more equitably distributed in the first place? And I imagine that that would drastically cut down food waste. Yeah, the, the question was, if you heard it, that how can we move our food system to one that recognizes food as a human right so that we can more equitably distribute the food? Is that a fair summary of what, of what you asked? Um, that's a political question. I mean, you asked a question about politics. The, um, I'm not in favor of establishing a secondary food system that will feed the poor. Um, I don't think that's something that we want to do in the long run politically. In our, in our private food distribution system, food banks, soup kitchens, and so forth, we have created a parallel food distribution system in, in parallel with our regular food distribution system. I think our food system should feed everybody. That's a political issue. That requires convincing your legislators that poverty is a problem that all of us share in, that if people had adequate, healthy food, it would be better for everybody. It's not charity. It's social justice, and that's what we have to be working for. Run for office. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, let's try to get a question from over here, this gentleman. With all the uh, political references, are you familiar with issues like up in Maine where states um, have asserted, I think they were, the federal government was trying to shut down um, meat processing, and there's about a year ago. If other areas where states' rights seem to be one avenue as opposed to going to figure out hundreds of programs in a farm bill, uh, states like Maine, I think Michigan, are trying to establish more autonomy at a state level? Is that a, a viable way to start to dismantle some of the problematic areas of the uh, political side of the food system? Yeah. I, I'm having a hard time hearing the microphones, but um, are you asking if, if, if delegating a lot of this responsibility to the states would be a more effective way? More, more like is it a more effective battleground to choose? Oh, I think, I always say if you're going to be uh, doing political battles, you do, you start local. Um, you start at your local area and then work up to the state. Um, I thought maybe you were asking whether having some of this legislation um, done as block grants to states, that's a fine idea if you're in a good state, but if you're not in a, if you're not in a state that cares about social justice, it's not going to work very well. So, but yes, local, act local. Let's get somebody from the middle, maybe in the back. Is there anyone back there who wants to ask a question? I see plenty of hands. Hello, um, my name's Evan Ellers. Uh, I'm the founder of a nonprofit, uh, university-based nonprofit in Philadelphia called Sharing Excess. Um, so we create university donation programs so that students can donate their leftover meals. Um, and we also partner with local businesses to help them conduct food rescue operations. Um, now, I love what I do, and I want to inspire students all over the United States to share their food access with community members in need. Um, but we need money. Uh, we need money to run. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to do this after I graduate. But right now, a uh, big question is where are we going to get funding and how are we going to establish a sustainable business model? Um, so if you have any advice, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, you've asked a really tough question. It's great to be working with non-governmental organizations on these kinds of issues, but you're all competing for the same pot of money from the same uh, collection of people. That's why we need federal policies. 
there shouldn't be people on college campuses who are worried about whether, where their next meal is coming from. There shouldn't be a single child in a grammar school who worries about getting enough food to eat during the day. These are political issues that our government should be dealing with. I believe that this is government responsibility. Um, and for you to be creating a parallel system um, means that you're putting yourself in a position where you've got to raise money and you're going to be raising money from the same sources, individuals, foundations, that everybody else is raising money from. Maybe have a coalition of organizations. That might be one way to do it. So you have bigger fundraising power. I don't know. I don't envy your job. But I think we need to change the political system. In the short run, what you're doing is fantastic. In the long run, we need to change the political system. Over here, in the front. Hi, my name is Isabel. I'm uh, here representing a Queens legislator for the New York State Assembly. Um, so as a state elected official rep, I wanted to ask regarding policy change, since it's something that you keep bringing up, if you have, any, uh, for office. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any concrete ideas for the local city and state level elected officials to propose uh, fixing the food system or food reduction legislation, slash have you ever personally reached out? Because it's one thing for people to constantly bring up the problem and say that legislators need to act, but the ideas need to come from these organizations that maybe haven't reached out. So first question, first part of the question is, do you have any ideas? And the second part would be, just out of curiosity, if you've ever reached out to any elected officials, legislators, etc. Um, I haven't personally. I'm one of those people who writes books and teaches. <laughs> um, but how wonderful that you're in a position to change the food system. Um, and that's really what you want. If, there, if you were multiplied, by how many of you are needed to have a majority in the assembly? Or did I not understand you? Yeah, so technically it's the state level, it's a two house, right? And we are, the assembly is the majority. It's really legislation gets stuck at the Senate. It's really what? It gets, the legislation gets stuck in the Senate. In the Senate. Um, mm. At the state level. So, so yeah. all you can do is lobby. Um, no, we can pass it. We can uh -huh. pass the bills, but it needs to pass in the Senate, and then right. the governor gets on the governor's right. desk. So. I mean, if you're in a position to make changes, um, you can deal with a large number of issues that affect public health. Um, you can deal in Albany with New York City's transportation system, for example, which has a great deal to do with providing access to food. For, many, for the majority of people in the city. Um, you can deal with legislation um, dealing with school food. Extremely important to do that. You can deal with, how about regional food hubs so that farmers who are upstate can get their produce to New York City eat more easily than they currently can. Um, how about promoting gleaning programs for farmers who, uh, whose fields are littered with perfectly good food mm -hmm. at the end of the harvest season, but nobody wants to bother to come and pick it uh, because it's out of the way or inconvenient or they have no way to transport it. I mean, I think there are loads and loads of ways of trying to intervene in the food system if you're in a position to legislate. So legislate away. <laughs> That's great. All right, maybe well, thanks time. for coming. <laughs> maybe time for one, maybe two more questions, but make it a good one. <laughs> but uh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll cut you off. <laughs> because this is your bailiwick, just how many phone calls does it take for a politician to pay attention? Oh, I'm told it's very few. Um, what I'm told over and over and over again is that they get so few phone calls, so few emails, so few letters, so few visits that 10 gets their attention. Um, and that if you go and visit a representative staff with a group of 
five or ten people, they'll pay attention. Yeah. Um, and really, lobbying is very easy to do. You just prepare a fact sheet and off you go and go through it. Um, but most of us are not trained to do it. It seems very intimidating. Um, but I'm told by every single legislator that I've ever met that this kind of thing is very impressive Absolutely. and has a big impact. The, and the legislators I've met with in the past say, you know, have a story, have some concrete examples of what's happening to a family or a community. And I think all of us in this room probably have a lot of those stories. Yeah. And, and one other thing is you must talk to them about legislation because that's what they do. So you come with a suggestion for legislation and then the reasons why you think that's important to do. Absolutely. Um, and do it over and over and over again. Absolutely. All right, I'm going to take one more question, and that has to be it. Um, I went right here. Hi, my name is Christine Dimmick. I'm an author. It's called Detox Your Home is my book. And my question for you is I've lobbied, gone to D.C. and lobbied, um, and right now we're trying to get legislation passed on Monsanto and Roundup in our New York City parks. It's sprayed everywhere. <laughs> And it was up for, it was up for mm -hmm. a vote, and it didn't pass. Mm -hmm. There's 90 pages of test to vote. Mm -hmm. um, and it causes cancer. So how do we deal with, when you say run, how do we deal with people who are getting paid off, even at the city council level? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you expose it, for one thing. Um, and I think this is a situation where you work with the press, um, you make sure you get decent press coverage, you, exp you get the press to investigate and expose. I don't know if any of you have seen the New York Times this morning. It's got eight pages of exposure. Um, and the, um, uh, you know, the, the Roundup issue is a really complicated one. And there is now increasing evidence of the companies that make Roundup and sell Roundup um, of their manipulation of the science base and their attempts to influence exactly this kind of thing. So I would expect that there would be companies that are behind a decision not to use Roundup in the, to not to do anything about stopping use of Roundup in the parks. You just have to keep at it and try to get it exposed. That's why we still have a press. Use it. <laughs> I think that's great advice to end on. I want to thank Mary Nessel for being here. Can all give her a round of applause?